Welcome to Postcards, a brief look at people, places, the arts and curiosities from around the world. On today's program, a sneak preview of what will be one of the largest sculptures on the planet. An update on London's new tourist attractions, the Millennium Dome and London Eye. The sport of kings, we go behind the scenes at Britain's national stud in Newmarket. The Walsall Gallery, a new home for sculptor Sir Jacob Epstein's work. And the rebuilding of a Lutheran cathedral in Dresden. But first up, the lowlands of central Scotland, exactly halfway between Edinburgh and Glasgow. The setting for what will be one of the largest working sculptures on the planet. It's the Falkirk Wheel, a rotating boat lift measuring 25 metres in diameter. The wheel is the modern replacement for a flight of locks, part of a millennium project that's intended to restore the canal link between Scotland's two main cities. British Waterways says the wheel will be an enormous piece of working art, the only structure of its kind in the world. The wheel is the centrepiece of the Millennium Link, a $125 million US project to join the Forth and Clyde and Union Canals, linking the Irish Sea and North Atlantic to the North Sea for the first time in 35 years. It's the largest canal restoration ever. Only a few generations ago, the canals were the main arteries across central Scotland, a key factor in the development of industry and communities along their length. Although still popular with holiday makers, the rise of rail and road transport led to a decline in canal use, leaving behind economically devastated communities. The purpose of the project is to kickstart community regeneration across the centre of Scotland. Reopening the canal will provide a focus. Work is due to be completed on the restoration project by Easter 2001, making the canal's fully navigable waterways for the first time in almost four decades. The Falkirk Wheel, at their midpoint, will be a monument to the future. The voices of 13-year-old Welsh singing star Charlotte Church and an accompanying choir echo around London's Millennium Dome. Just Wave Hello is the song chosen to launch the Dome's latest edition, the Journey Zone. The zone chronicles mankind's ingenuity in developing practical ways to travel around planet Earth. Carmaker Ford UK is the zone's sponsor. The company says it's looking to the future and the introduction of the fuel cell to replace the internal combustion engine as a means of power for automobiles. The output from the fuel cell is water vapour, so it's very clean, sure to please environmentalists. The car is expected to be on the roads in Britain by 2005. The Journey Zone was officially opened by Queen Elizabeth last New Year's Eve as part of the Dome's Millennium Celebrations. Meanwhile outside, overcast skies, but the weather failed to dampen the spirits of those about to board the city's new landmark, the Millennium Wheel, or London Eye. A month after its expected launch date, passengers who had been disappointed on New Year's Eve made it on board the wheel as it finally began to turn. The 32 nine-tonne capsules, whose clutches had proved so problematic, passed their final safety check, offering unprecedented views over London. The 56 million US dollar 150 metre eye is now the world's largest observation wheel. <laughs> its 2,100 tonne structure can carry 800 people at any one time, just as well as 600,000 people have booked tickets in advance. British Airways has planning permission for the wheel for five years. But given that the Eiffel Tower was only expected to last for 12 months, it's quite probable that the London Eye 
will prove to be one of the city's most outstanding landmarks for years to come. And for tourists planning a cross-channel trip, here's an alternative to air travel. Weighing in at nearly 30 tonnes, she's the largest cross-channel ferry ever to ply the Straits of Dover and probably the most luxurious. Operated by P&O Stenner Line, this multi-million dollar state-of-the-art ship can carry up to 2,000 passengers, 600 cars or a combination of cars, caravans, coaches and freight vehicles. The owners say that since the opening of the Euro Tunnel, providing direct rail links between Britain and France, ferry services have been faced with increasing competition. Their aim now is to provide a complete luxury package, catering, they say, for people who want to enjoy the crossing and travel in style. The operators have spent $6.4 million US refurbishing the interior, giving customers a huge choice of where they can relax or where they can dine. That choice includes everything from burger bars and New York delis to the fine cuisine of Langan's Brasserie, a branch of the famous Langan's restaurant in London, renowned for its traditional English food. And so far, passengers say they're impressed. But if wining and dining isn't necessarily your style, then there's always the last minute shopping. Perhaps, weather permitting, a stroll outside as you relish the supermarket prices in the French port of Calais. Once known as the sport of kings, now racing is a sport for everyone. But what goes into producing a horse with the sort of qualities needed to win the big races, leaving as little as possible to chance? Here at the National Stud at Newmarket, they have for years been breeding Britain's best. The National Stud is once again open for a new season of breeding. Before the year is out, 500 acres and 230 stables will see the birth of around 80 foals. And around 350 mares will leave with a new birth ahead of them. People send mares from all over Europe to come to the stallions here. Then during the off-season, Newmarket sends stallions out to the Southern Hemisphere. Founded in 1916, the Stard's original aim was to help boost the dwindling number of horses after thousands were killed while serving in the First World War. But with the end of fighting, the focus switched to breeding racehorses and a string of classic winners were born. In 1963, many of the brood mares were sold and a stallion stable set up. The change also signalled a change in location. The Stard was moved from Ireland to England. The stud's most famous horse remains the legendary Mill Reef, winner of 12 top races, including the English Derby and France's Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. Once in his paddock, Mill Reef is at home with his fans. In fact, when he's in front of a crowd, he's rather a ham actor. He's a very gentle horse, especially with children, and he's always on the lookout for any candy or carrots they might bring him. Up to eight top pedigree stallions live here permanently, and with a value of six million dollars, the famous Hector Protector is one of the stud's biggest draw cards. Some of these stallions will mate with as many as 60 mares before the season is over. Here, the mares and stallions are brought together in a process called teasing. An aggressive reaction by the female indicates she's not yet ready to mate. She'll have to be brought back later. But by lifting her tail, this mare indicates she'll accept the stallion's advances. 
when the mares start arriving at the stud, most are in the final stages of pregnancy and are taken straight to the foaling unit. Nature has equipped the mare to conceive shortly after she's given birth. In the wild, she would need to produce a foal every year to maintain herd numbers. By February, the workload of the start is steadily growing. The number of mares arriving is increasing and the real work begins. Each yard and every one of the 200 stables will have to be mucked out, up to four tonnes of straw used every day. This year, 18 foreign students have been selected to work here. If they're successful, they'll leave with a prestigious National Stud Diploma. It's an intensive five-month course during which students are exposed to everything from mucking out to foaling. Abba Nyamapanamunda from Zimbabwe can't believe he was chosen for the course. He applied only after a doctor friend persuaded him. Abba's biggest problem now is getting used to the cold English weather, but already hard at work, he's quickly warming up. Some of the British students hope to take their experience to other parts of the world, working in horse management or as a bloodstock agent. With a national stud diploma, opportunities will abound. During the foaling season, students will spend many a night watching the mares foal. There are four cameras which are moved from box to box to help keep check on all the residents. If a mare has been uncomfortable the night before, she can be moved to a box where she can be watched without causing further discomfort by the obvious presence of staff. Most births at the start are straightforward. Only 2 to 3 per cent are complicated. And as soon as the foal is pulled clear, the umbilical cord is broken and mother and baby can start to bond. There is then the joy of watching the youngster find its feet for the first time. In the days following, most of the mares will be mated with a stallion. Computer programs and veterinary expertise are combined to determine the best time for conception. By May, it's tourist time for the stud. Thousands of visitors come here each year. As autumn closes in, the youngsters will leave the stud. Around 2,000 of them will be auctioned and be taken to their new homes all over the world. According to the stud's chief executive, Newmarket could be considered a dream provider. Each foal, each mare or stallion gives someone the opportunity or the dream that they can produce the next Derby winner, the next champion racehorse. This massive structure at the end of the Birmingham Canal system in an industrial town called Walsall embodies a new trend the art world is mightily keen to promote. Bringing art to the community, rather than restricting it to the world's major cities, is the primary concern of Walsall's new art gallery. The $34.6 million US building in the West Midlands will be the permanent home for a world-class collection based on the work of sculptor Sir Jacob Epstein. Epstein, his partner, artist Kathleen Garman, and sculptor friend Sally Ryan worked closely from the 1930s. They produced their own artworks and collected those of their favourite artists, 
among them Gauguin, Dufy, Delacroix and Modigliani. These now hang side by side at Walsall, an approach bigger galleries would have shied away from. There are unusual and early examples from the greats. A monochrome sketch by Fauvist Henri Matisse. A crisp line drawing by Van Gogh in 1882 and one the self-loathing artist considered his best work to date. A still life by landscape artist John Constable. Through these examples, we discover the processes and paths traveled by the artists before they reached their signature styles. The gallery is intimately sized, with pictures hung at a lower height than is usual. It's all designed to mirror the home-like atmosphere created by depictions of the collector's friends, lovers and families. The pieces look almost as if in conversation with one another. The gallery's opening exhibition is an exploration of how 20th century artists have used the colour blue. The centrepiece is from Picasso's Blue Period. Artists like Yves Klein, Marc Chagall and Joan Miro love the colour. The Blue Rider movement is represented by Franz Marc. Walsall Gallery has commissioned work from modern artists like David Nash and Tony Cragg's Plastic Policeman to stand next to the likes of Andy Warhol's Last Supper. While Picasso used blue to express melancholy, the colour has meant something different for other artists. The Damien Hirst spot painting is entitled Pink for Boys, Blue for Girls. The gallery director, Peter Jenkinson, describes the sculpture The Blue Tack as playful. In keeping with plans to reach out to all sectors of society, Walsall has a special children's gallery to encourage youngsters to think about art. Local school children have continued the blue theme in their art classes and the high street shops have become their gallery. It's all about making art part of everyday life and breaking down the perception that art galleries are great city fortresses. Until the last winter of the Second World War, the historic German city of Dresden had largely escaped serious damage. Then it was devastated by British and American bombers. 35,000 people died in the bombardment and the firestorms that swept the city. The medieval Frauenkirche, the Lutheran Cathedral of Dresden, was one of the buildings lost in the raids. Exactly 55 years on, the present inhabitants of this former East German metropolis braved winter weather to gather outside the Frauenkirche, now being rebuilt for a ceremony of reconciliation between wartime enemies. This eight metre high cross and orb was the focus. Hand built by British craftsmen, the cross and orb will replace the one lost in the wartime bombing. Under a banner calling for the people of Britain and Germany to build bridges and live reconciliation, local church leaders were joined by the German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder and the Anglican Bishop of Coventry, an English city twinned with Dresden and whose own cathedral was destroyed by German bombers. The Duke of Kent, cousin of the British Queen, officially handed over the cross and orb to the church and received in return a miniature replica. The Duke said the cross should be a living symbol of Anglo-German friendship. The Auburn cross was made in London and commissioned by the Dresden Trust a British charity which collected nearly half a million dollars from individuals and businesses. Ironically, Alan Smith, one of the craftsmen, is the son of a British bomber pilot who took part in the raids on Dresden. 
The work of restoring the Frauenkirche will not be finished until 2006, Dresden's eighth centenary. But with hymns and prayers, the shining Auburn cross rose slowly into the wintry sky, ready to form again a landmark on the skyline of this ancient European city. Britain is using the internet for a worldwide appeal for information to fill in the gaps of the provenance of works of art, which could possibly have been looted by the Nazis during the Holocaust. This weighty volume from Britain's Galleries and Museums Commission reports the research undertaken by 23 institutions over the last year to establish where artworks came from during the period between 1933 and 1945. Three institutions, the Imperial War Museum, the National Library of Wales and the Natural History Museum have completed their research and have established beyond a doubt that no works in their collections are of doubtful provenance. Ten institutions, among them the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Tate, the National and Portrait Galleries and the British Museum, have published lists of works where provenance is incomplete. There's no real reason to suspect these paintings were Nazi loot, as most were in England at the time, but more information is needed to eliminate them completely from suspicion. Because most of the people who could provide information have died, records are incomplete, letters and invoices have been thrown away. Until there is documentary evidence to prove that work is clean, it remains on the list. The Tate originally had 587 objects with incomplete provenance. The year's painstaking work closed the information gap on 507 items, leaving only 80 on the list. Britain is the first country in the world to publish lists, following on from similar work done in the Netherlands. It's considered restitution to try to return goods to survivors and their families, to get stolen property off the walls of museums and galleries and return it to the rightful owners. So far, the researchers yielded a claim on one painting hanging in the Tate Gallery. A special government advisory committee has been set up to deal with this and any future claims. The next step is to bring Britain's regional galleries into the process, to eliminate any connection between their treasures and this sinister period of modern history. And that's all for today. Join us again next time for a postcard look at interesting people, places and the arts.